Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert Dr. Amy Vazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I have one of the most respected surgeons in the entire world who specializes in endometriosis on today's show. Welcome, Dr. Cameron Najat. Hi, Dr. Najat. Hello. We're going to be talking about endometriosis and advancements in laparoscopic and robotic surgery with no one better than our special guest today. Let me, guys, let me tell you guys a little bit about him. He's world-renowned, minimally invasive and robotic surgeon specializing in treating endometriosis and is the recipient in 2020 of the Distinguished Service Award for Meritorious Service in the Science and Art of Medicine from the American Medical Association. He was chosen by them as an exceptional innovator and trailblazer whose significant contributions have revolutionized modern day surgery. He's best known for inventing video assisted endoscopy and was the first to perform groundbreaking advances in minimally invasive surgical procedures that have helped millions of patients around the globe. He has been called the father of modern day surgery for inventing and pioneering video laparoscopy and video assisted and endoscopy surgery and welcome. But before, before I wanna show you guys these articles that I printed out. Um, this is Dr. Najat, um, before, before we, we have him say hi, from in 1984 talking um, about, he was one of the dozen Atlanta super doctors. This is November of 1984. This is Time Magazine, 1986, Medicine, the Career Woman's Disease. And then here we have Hanging Up the Knife, a novel surgical technique. This is 1990 in Newsweek. So I'm so honored to have Dr. Najat on today. Welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Amy. You are very kind. It is indeed an honor and privilege to be with you. And I would like to congratulate you so much for your groundbreaking work and information and what you are doing to help the public. I admire you and I am a devotee of your work. Oh, thank you. Well, it's very mutual for sure. So you're obviously highly accomplished in so many areas of GYN surgery medicine. And today I want to talk about your work on endometriosis. What made you go into this field? You know, uh, there are several factors that, you know, looking back has uh, made me or directed me to that direction. One of them has been since I was much younger during medical school and residency. I was interested in endometriosis because of the some of my own loved ones had endometriosis. And other issue was during my career, I found endometriosis to be uh, an enigmatic and perplexing disease. It is a still, and. When I was during my training, I was lucky to work with some pioneers in endometriosis in uh, State University of New York in Buffalo. It was Dr. Matt, and in Medical College of Georgia was Dr. Ron Green, um, Bob Greenblatt, and their interest was in fertility, endometriosis, and also pelvic pain. So from the very beginning, I was witnessing the struggles of young patients who either had severe pain because of endometriosis or they were struggling with getting pregnant. And my teacher, my professor, they were talking about how confusing, how enigmatic this condition is. For example, 
very small amount of endometriosis would cause so much pain that the poor patient had to stay home for three, four days and not go to work, not go to school. Small amount of disease could create so much problem. That's one problem. The other one, you could see patients that had more severe endometriosis and they had no pain at all. And the same way, there were couples that they would come and they had no symptoms at all, no pain, no problem. They were a couple, they were trying to get pregnant. All of their tests were normal. She was fine, he was fine, and then they wouldn't get pregnant. Then we would do a, at that time, we would do a diagnostic laparoscopy. It was without a video. And there was a small amount of endometriosis around the ovaries or around the abdomen. And that was the reason for infertility of the patient. They would, then we would make a large incision from hip bone to hip bone, even for a small amount of disease to go ahead and we just treat that small amount of endometriosis. So that issue made me, my focus on endometriosis. That is why I focus on endometriosis um, because of the problem that I encountered those patients, they, were facing, I saw, as I mentioned, they were making hip bone to hip bone or from up and down incision for a small amount of disease. And it is, books are written about it. Actually, my professor had a book about it, how to do microsurgery even for a small amount of disease. And that is why I became interested and, and um, made me to go in this field and try to develop and do whatever I, I am doing and I have done. And can you explain endometriosis to our audience? Like, what is it? How is it diagnosed? And how does it really impact the body? Endometriosis is a whole body disease. It is, it could affect every organ of the body. It is not a disease of only reproductive organs. It is not confined to the uterus, tubes, or ovaries. No, it could be practically in every organ of the body. Um, it is a tissue that, thank goodness, is benign. It looks, the tissue under the microscope, it looks like the tissue that it is inside of the lining of the uterus but it could grow on the brain, it could grow on the lungs, in the, in the lungs, it could grow on the diaphragm, stomach, on the bowel, bladder, ureter, you name it, on the skin, on the appendix. It is a whole body disease and should be taught as such and should be taught in the medical schools that way and uh, so on and so forth. Yeah. <laughs> and then historically, I mean, you mentioned the hip to hip surgery. Are there other historical treatments that you can tell us about? Yes. Uh, thank you for asking me that question. You know, endometriosis is an ancient disease. And endometriosis is, has been and is going to continue to be unless we do something about it for thousands of years. It is a condi this condition unfortunately has affected millions and millions of women and because it is so common, it has become part of the culture that we think it is normal. It has become a 
it has been accepted that it is a normal situation of the body. If endometriosis indeed was a man's disease, a problem for the men, I bet you by now we have at least better understanding of what it is, and at least we have made, made far, far more progress because, as I said, it has been present as long as human beings, women have existed. These patients have undergone all kinds of cruel treatments, cruel treatments that they have paid for it. For example, women have been subject at one time, they thought that they have been possessed by demons, so they used to uh, throw away these patients from the top of the a bridge in cold water to make sure the position disappears, or they thought for a long time that these patients, they have an angry uterus, and the problem is the uterus is traveling all over the body and creates the problem, so they used to hang the patient upside down on a ladder and shake the patient that the uterus goes back. They used to use all kind of insects for the treatment, all kind of uh, uh, man-made herbs, uh, and uh, to put it on the skin, put it in the, all, all the organs of the body to treat this affected patient with all kind of medication. So, and unfortunately, things for a while even got worse. At least years, years ago, they would accept it that this is a disease that affects the organ. They didn't know what it was. And as time went on, because often endometriosis, lesions are so small that nobody can feel them or you cannot have a MRI or a CT or an ultrasound to diagnose them. Thus, unfortunately, these affected patients, they paid for it and Freud made it worse for them and called them hysteric women and they call it hysteria. So in this area, then I started treating the patient with antidepressants. Um, in another area, they thought, oh, the only reason is that she, the patient has pain is because she wants, the uterus wants to be pregnant and she has to get married and she has to have sex. That is the reason. So there has been, uh, and we published a paper about it, endometriosis, ancient disease, ancient treatment. I recommend to your audience, if they are interested, it is on fertility and sterility, and they can easily look at it. And uh, it is a fascinating read to see what the patient over the years, the... Yeah, and I have the article here. It's endometriosis right here ancient disease, ancient treatments, and I'll make sure in the article that goes with our interview today, people can access it and they can download it and read a copy of them for themselves because I found it very interesting. So thank you for bringing that all up. So where did you see the opportunity to change these treatments, especially around surgery? We used to do a laparoscopy, that it is a tube to put it in the abdomen through the belly button and then to check to see if there is any problem. And then very often there was endometriosis. And when there was endometriosis, even for minute amount of disease, we would make a large incision. It would take half an hour to make the incision to get in the abdomen and half an hour to close the abdomen to do probably take five, sometimes very really about five to six minutes to treat that endometriosis. So 
I thought to myself, my God, we are doing so much more harm. Why just don't we treat that little disease with uh, the laparoscope without cutting the patient? And that is when it led me to invent and pioneer video assisted endoscopic surgery because at that time everybody, when we wanted to look in the abdomen, we had to look through one eye. Um, it was very, very uncomfortable. We couldn't do much. And uh, it was only a one man band. Then that led me to invent video assisted endoscopy that uh, revolutionized modern day surgery. Uh, and, and fundamentally what we did, we just made the surgery from a, a one man band to an orchestra. Um, as the technology got better, the video endoscopes, the magnifications are so much better. The lights are so much better. Um, so we can see minute amount of endometriosis even much, much better than we can. We couldn't see it before. And we started treating the affected patient by this method that obviously changed the world for the patient with endometriosis. Yeah, and what are the benefits from laparoscopic surgery? The benefits of minimally invasive surgery or uh, laparoscopic surgery comparing to the old techniques is that we make tiny incision comparing to the very large incision and the by this small incision we make patient recovers much much faster usually in the old days when I was in training, we used to keep these patients in the hospital sometimes from four to sometimes seven days, depending what they had. And they had a lot of pain. They had to take about six to eight weeks to recover. Now, the same procedures that I do now, the majority of my patients are going home within the first two hours and they start walking the same day. You know, you and I have been working together for a long time and you have seen we have common patients that some of the most typical patients, all of them, they go home within a couple of hours. The recovery of these patients are much faster. Another significant benefit of this technology is because we are able to look with a magnification of the camera, and we magnify all the tissue, the amount of endometriosis that we diagnose is much, much more, and we are able to treat the disease much more thoroughly. And the more thorough we are for the treatment, obviously the results are much better. And another benefit is because the, we don't make those large incisions, one of the problems with surgery, when you make large incision, even smaller incision, is adhesion formation, scar tissue formation. A scar tissue is a part of natural healing of the body. So by making a smaller incision, body has less to heal, thus there would be less adhesion formation. And also, because we do not open up the abdomen by large incision, the tissue doesn't become dry. The dryness of the tissue by large incision causes more adhesion formation, more scar tissue formation. And another advantage is when we make those small incision versus large incision, the amount of bleeding is significantly less. And the less bleeding you have, the results are better, and the scar tissue formation better, less. So 
overall the results are much much better in every aspect for the patient and because the patient doesn't have to stay in the hospital so long to recover the cost is also significantly less and what advice do you have for a woman with fertility issues who may have endometriosis the majority of the patient that we see and we help and we have published a paper with yourself recently that these women when have no symptom but they want to get pregnant when you laparoscope them more than 90 percent of them in our practice they have endometriosis and if they are treated properly and treated well without causing any harm the chance of success is very very high and we had a group of patients recently evaluated that had had failed IVF they had also gone through all kind of hormonal treatment they did not get pregnant this patient were referred to us we evaluated this patient when we evaluated them in excess of 92 to 3 percent they had endometriosis and then when we treated them if they were younger the a good portion of them got pregnant on their own if they were older they went back to their infertility specialist and the, um, like yourself and their embryo transfer was very successful and they got pregnant in the study that we compared this group recently and um, we, we just submitted that to the american society of reproductive medicine one of our fellows actually the two of our fellows here dr uh, Janelle Jackman and Dr. Shruti Agrawal, they wrote this uh, abstract. So the impact of endometriosis on infertility is significant. It needs to be evaluated more and patient affected in that way should be educated and also we should do a better job training surgeons to treat this patient properly and causing no harm to people's benefit. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, seriously. I mean, thank you for bringing attention to this and for all your work in the publications because I feel like sometimes I make recommendations and then patients haven't heard those recommendations before so they don't necessarily believe what I'm telling them. So I feel like the more literature is out there, the more studies are published, we're just moving things forward to protect people from harm. So thank you for that. So you've also developed many other techniques and hold multiple patents for surgical inventions and developments. And you also created the first endometriosis specialist subspecialty in minimally invasive and robotic surgery fellowship, embracing a multidisciplinary approach. And then you're also known for a multidisciplinary approach and embracing that. What does that mean when it comes to endometriosis care? Well, thank you for asking me that question. You know, endometriosis is, as I said, it is a whole body disease and we need to address every aspect of the endometriosis. It is not only in the reproductive organ. Endometriosis, for example, could cause silent loss of the kidney. There are patients that they have some mild cramping around your flank, around their side, and they think it is normal. But if endometriosis attacks that uh, ureter that brings urine from the kidney to the bladder, gradually, although rare, but there are patients that they lose their kidney. Unfortunately, I see patients like that all the time from all around the world that that referred to me that simply, you know, the unfortunate situation has happened. Or that is an area that if the surgeon is familiar, he can work with a urologist and help those patients before anything like that happened. Or endometriosis often involved, causes a lot of 
back pain, rectal pain, pain with the bowel movement, and sometimes endometriosis involves the bowel. So, a experienced surgeon, endometriosis specialist, manages it properly by with a colorectal surgeon or by himself or herself if he, if he is very advanced that he could do that as well but we need a colorectal surgeon because it involves the bowel as well and it has the management is quite different if indeed the disease is related to pain or infertility or the symptom so we should not go and resect everybody's bowel or resect everybody's ureter or bladder. That is why there isn't going to be a lot of knowledge about that. Endometriosis could affect the liver, the lungs, and the diaphragm. Some patients, they might have shoulder pain on a monthly basis at the very beginning that gradually becomes uh, constant. And I see endometriosis could be involving the diaphragm. That is why it is useful to work with a thoracic surgeon that with collaboration together to treat the patient that way. So, uh, and that goes so on and so forth. Sometimes the same thing, endometriosis could affect the nose and the patient ha could have monthly bleeding from her nose or uh, patient endometriosis sometimes affects the umbilicus, the belly button. So, or sometimes endometriosis involves some patients who have had cesarean section and involves the cesarean section scar. So, this needs a knowledgeable person to address it and deal with it. Your quote, what the, what the brain doesn't know, the eyes don't see. What the mind doesn't know, the eyes don't see. So, we should know what we are looking for and we need to increase the awareness of endometriosis. Where do you see the future of laparoscopic surgery and other treatments for endometriosis patients? Where are we headed with those things? Uh, endometriosis is far, far more common than we believe. They think it is one out of 10 has endometriosis. That's a huge number. My research, my research, which we have published it, speaks different. We believe that endometriosis is much more than one in 10. I think one in 10 is an underestimation. Our data, our, my data shows more significantly more than what we think. So, what can we do for all of these people? Can we do surgery on everybody? That's a huge number of surgery. Because by surgery at the present time, if the surgeon is very experienced and knows how he does it, he could really go and remove and excise, take the disease out very carefully without causing any damage to other organs. But can we operate on several hundred million women around the world? So we have to find some method to diagnose this endometriosis better, methods to prevent it, and methods to treat it much better. And that is why it has been my passion and for that purpose, that is why we started a grassroots organization called World Wide Endometriosis March or Endomarch in summary and also dedicated a day at the last Saturday of every March called Worldwide Endometriosis Day. And the reason that we decided to start that is because we have published so much articles about endometriosis. And prior to us, 
many people have published about endometriosis. But when somebody like me, who has a lot of interest in endometriosis, goes on and life goes on, like other pioneers who have passed away, then the interest goes down. I didn't want that to happen. And that is why we started that. And more than 60 countries around the world have joined. And I'm very pleased to see more and more interest internationally on endometriosis. <laughs> Governments are getting involved. They are putting more money in different countries that have been started teaching about endometriosis that, as I said, if this was a man's disease, we had some, something more, we knew more about it. And hopefully now we do some actions about it. We do find something that endometriosis, it is not a cancer, but behaves like a cancer. A lot of time behaves like a cancer. And the effects could be devastating on a young girl, young patient, uh, young uh, uh, genetically female patient and in a young couple or a young group, uh, group that they want to have a child. So the effects could be devastating. We need to do something about it. And I'm happy that Worldwide Endomars ignited that worldwide attention that uh, we see more publicity about endometriosis and more writings about endometriosis that hopefully we can move the pendulum forward. And how can phys physicians, not just in the United States, but around the world, get involved in Endomarch? Worldwide Endomarch is, uh, as I mentioned, is a grassroots. It is for physicians, patients to e raise awareness. And it is open to everybody through the Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, all of them are welcome. They can easily register and uh, email Worldwide Endomarch. Easily they can go on WW Endomarch or Worldwide Endomarch or Endometriosis Mark. Very easily they could email us or email Endomarch. It has the biggest staff around the world and they would connect you wherever you are in the world. They would connect you with the uh, activities of Worldwide Endomarch to try to help you to get you at least some answers to know that you are not alone and direct you to the best that, that Worldwide Endomarch can to the right direction. So for people out there who actually want to see you as a patient, where can they find you? How do they schedule a consult with you? Uh, again, thank you for asking. I am actively very active. I operate uh, at least four days a week. In average, I do surgery about uh, eight to 14 cases in every week, uh, all endometriosis. Um, uh, it is very easy to find me. Just put my name, nejat.org, N-E-Z-H-A-T.org, and all the information is there, the telephone numbers, email address, everything is there. And it would be a pleasure to see you and guide you and help anybody who would like to come. Thank you. I've absolutely loved our conversation today. I adore you. I, I tell my patients that you literally, for me, have the hands of God. And you take incredible care and you listen and make my patients feel heard. So thank you for everything that you do. Um, Amy, you touch my heart. You are so kind to say that. I am privileged and honored to have been able to have a gift to help uh, thousands of patients. And uh, I am happy to work with you and anybody in any way that I think uh, I can help them. I am open to that. And also I wanted to mention that for patients around the world that they are trying to find somebody. Unfortunately, endometriosis needs somebody who is really well trained. 
we would be happy if you send us an email. We might know some physicians in your area to refer you. We have started, I am training surgeons as endometriosis subspecialists. Um, the fellows who come to us every year, two to three of them, they come from the best institution trained in this country and they spend time with us and with the Society of Lapro Laparoscopic and Robotic Surgeon. Society of Laparoscopic and Robotic Surgeon was the first society who has started a fellowship on exclusively for endometriosis and we have been training some fellows every year about endometriosis that they go across the country and some of them are into some of the best institutions that are teaching endometriosis again. So that is one area that uh, we can help. Thank you again for joining us today. We, we love you. Thank you so much. It is a, really a, a pleasure to be with you. And thank you very much. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadine. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 